Hey everybody, it's Dr. Sarah Godfrey. Welcome to The Health Bridge. I'm here with Dr. Pedram Shojai. Hey Pedram. Hey, hi Sarah, hi everybody. So guys, we are here with Katie, also known as Wellness Mama. Welcome Katie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Well, we're thrilled you're here. I just want to say here by way of a quick bio that you are the mother of five children. Is that right? It's, yep, five children. Five kids. Oh my gosh. Okay, Pedram has one. I have two. So you definitely win the prize there. You're also <laughs> a certified nutrition consultant, right? I am. Cool. And I know that you are very popular in terms of the uh, work that you do on foods and lifestyle over at wellnessmama.com. It's grown really quickly and I think it's the message that honestly is so important right now and that's why it's grown. It's just people are so hungry for that message. Well, let's talk about that message, right? I mean, Pedram, that's that's what we should be talking about today. 100%. I mean, as, as a new father, um, it's amazing how many things come onto your radar um, when you know, you've been kind of oblivious to them when you bring a child in the world. You're like, whoa, 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 what do we do for this? Why would I put that on my child? And so all of a sudden, uh, Wellness Mama becomes a, a, a critical resource uh, for people who have brought in children who really you know, are tired of the misinformation, uh, tired of seeing every kid around them getting sick and, and, and learning, trying to learn what to do better around. So I'd love to hear how you kind of got into it because it wasn't like, you know, this kind of master plan that you would put together or anything like that. You're a mom who who cares. And, and I'd love for you to share that with the audience quickly. Yeah, absolutely. It actually started with my first child uh, when he was six weeks old. I might have told you this story before, but I was holding him in the doctor's office at my follow-up appointment and the, the six-week checkup they require and just flipping through a magazine and nursing him. And I came across a line in that magazine that said, for the first time in two centuries, the current generation of Americans will have a shorter lifespan than their parents. And I was holding my teeny tiny baby and reading that line and it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I decided that was not good enough. And I had before that had a career actually in journalism and ended up not pursuing it because a seasoned journalist had told me there's no such thing as objective media. Everybody works for someone and you're not going to make any changes. And reading that line, I said, you know what, I am going to make changes and I'm going to do it by reaching out to other moms because we're the ones who control the food budget and we're the ones who are shaping and raising and loving the next generation. And so I truly think moms and parents in general really have that power. And so my whole goal with Wellness Mama has been to just make a resource that was helpful for parents in providing that healthier lifestyle for their children so we don't have to deal with those statistics of, you know, 50-50 chance of cancer and heart disease and autoimmune disease and diabetes um, and just to provide a better future for our children. Mm, this is so good. There's nothing like an activated mother. <laughs> it's right? true. I think I read the quote once that uh, a, a worried mother will do better research than the FBI. And I would believe it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm writing that down. There's there's something so powerful about this, but I also want to say for our listeners, you know, we've got a lot of listeners who don't have kids, and I, I just want to say that it's kind of like that book, If the Buddha Came to Dinner. You know, we're not saying that you have to have kids to feel this way, but we want to take that, that special motivation that comes from holding your six-week-old and reading that line in the magazine about longevity and how it's actually getting shorter for the current generation. We want to galvanize that energy and apply it across the board, whether you have a kid or not. Absolutely. And obviously those health problems are going to affect all of us across the board, whether we have children or not. I just know, like Pedram said, you get a lot more motivated when you have a child, but absolutely. I think the change has to happen across the board with all of us. And it's sad because I'll see people do things for their child that they won't do for themselves. Right, which is an interesting way of kind of leveraging them into a healthier lifestyle because, like, you know, it's like, you know what, I'm already a goner, but I'll, I'll pay this forward into the next generation. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, part of how the next generation is suffering, I think, comes from how we've uh, not necessarily lived that way ourselves, which is a way to kind of bring them back. So I, I want to ask you, Katie, what is it specifically? that you're finding is really kind of waking up moms around. I mean, the mama bear energy, you and I talked about this offline, you know, it's like mama bear will do anything for her cubs. Like, what is it specifically that's getting moms to go like, oh man, I am listening to that banging drum and yes, I will make these changes. Like, uh, I, I'm so fascinated by change 
on a society level. And I think the moms are, are probably the best catalyst we have for that. Yeah, absolutely. For me, I've seen it's really the education side because I think every mom and every person to some degree has a desire to eat the, the right way for their body and to eat healthy foods and to live a healthy lifestyle. But in this day and age, it's hard to figure out sometimes what that is, especially for children, because there's just so much conflicting advice constantly, and especially the marketing side for children. It's the unhealthy processed foods that are marketed to them constantly in the store. Everything is kid level height, and it's processed and high fructose corn syrup and food dyes. And so on the one hand, we have that that influence in our lives really encouraging the junk food side. Um, and I think moms in instinctively know that that's not the best thing for their child, but they also sometimes don't know what the alternatives are or how to find them or how to prepare them. And it seems like a gigantic hurdle. So for me, I found the education side of teaching them how to actually practically make those foods and practically reduce chemicals and toxins they're exposed to every day and that their children are exposed to makes a big difference, but also just making it doable because it can seem like a mountain. And if you can turn it into just little practical steps, even if they're only getting through a few of those steps, they're still making a change. And I, so I think that's been the biggest factor and that's what I really try to focus on. Everything I write is that it's very doable and practical even if you're holding a baby or you know doing laundry at the same time that you can actually accomplish these things. I'm so glad, Katie, that you raised this issue of the simple steps because I think the shadow side of that line, give me the line again about the worried mom and the FBI. Oh, that a worried mother can do better research than the FBI. Yes, yes. And I, I feel like the shadow side of that, you know, as a mother of two daughters, is that we can be so worried that it depletes us. Mm -hmm. We can over provide and over accommodate and over care to the degree that it, it starts to burn us out. And so I want to focus on that point you made about these baby steps, about the small steps that add up to major transformation. Can we get into what those baby steps are? Yeah, so typically when people come to my site, new visitors, uh, I encourage them to take what is a 30-day wellness challenge, and it's free, and it's a daily email with one little tiny baby step. So it might be things like... Um, just figuring out ways to get rid of the processed food, but I try to focus on the positive. So instead of just never eat high fructose corn syrup again, never eat grains again, never eat sugar again, things like add more leafy greens to your diet. At every meal, make sure you're eating a big helping of leafy greens and a healthy form of protein. And then in the beginning, if you still want those other foods, don't feel like you have to deprive yourself because I feel like that mindset can be so dangerous for people. It's either all or nothing. And if they go off track once, then they just completely go off track and they binge. So I found like if you focus on the positive instead of never eat these things, focus on add these things in and just try to make sure that you're checking off all these healthy things every day then that helps a lot. And also there's baby steps in there as far as um, replacing conventional cleaning products with homemade alternatives, which anyone can do, mom or not, and those are inexpensive. You can make them in 20 seconds at home. And then if you don't have to worry about your children, your pets, whoever, getting chemicals from the floor or from the window or from your even your laundry, a lot of conventional cleaning products are a source of really harmful chemicals that can be absorbed into the body through the skin or the, um, the lungs. So just baby steps like that and giving them those practical recipes, um, things like meal planning, that old adage that those who plan to fail or fail to plan, plan to fail, is so true when it comes to food. And I know even for me, having been in this real food lifestyle for almost a decade now, if I don't meal plan, I still end up at 4.30 in the afternoon with everything still frozen and I'm like, what do I cook for dinner? So I think the planning aspect is also huge. And if you can just take out those steps of them having to figure it out and just give them simple solutions, it's a lot easier to make that adjustment for them. That's great. That's, you know, there's so much negativity. Like thou, there's so many thou shall nots that have grown out from the bit from the from the good book where now it's like what the heck do I eat like what do I do like I'm afraid of the world it's just coming to get me so I love the positive swaps I think that that's huge um, how do you counter the media big food complex I mean these kids are being 
uh, bombarded. Every single time I, I see uh, children's programming, it's surrounded by commercials that are driving them to beg you to spend your hard-earned dollars on poison for them, and, and they guilt you into it in a lot of ways. So, so I would love to hear how you interface with that and how to get moms to get these swaps and, and really uh, uh, lubricate how that works so that it's not an abrasive conflict with the kid, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an elegant swap. I think it's a two-sided problem, and it's so it's such a societal problem that is very deep on many levels. Even at restaurants, you've got kids' meals that are just absolute junk food. And even at gourmet restaurants, you, you can go and as an adult, you can order a really healthy meal, even have it cooked in healthy oils and everything else, and all the kid options are macaroni and cheese and fried chicken and just junk. And I think that partially that adults, we've created that problem for ourselves. Partially, we realize kids will eat those foods, so a lot of times we've conditioned that response knowing that they'll eat it, and so we cook it because it's easier. Um, but also just we think that kids don't have a naturally varied palate and that they only like those kind of foods when really we've taught them that or that's our perception, not necessarily theirs. So I think part of the solution is realizing that kids, um, they're, they're a lot more advanced on a lot of these things than we give them credit for. And so instead of just assuming that they only want to eat Fruit Loops and chicken nuggets, um, just giving them from day one, from the time they're, you know, your son's age, a varied diet, like let them try different foods from the very beginning. And even if you've got older children who weren't started out that way, children's palates are amazingly adaptable and they can adapt very quickly. But I think it takes um, us losing the mindset that they only like junk food. And then the flip side is, really educating them because children have such a deep desire to learn and if you teach them what why certain foods are good or bad for your body and how they actually affect the body kids love to learn that and they just soak it up and so my children help me cook all the time and we talk about how carrots have beta carotene and that can be good for your eyes or how every you know every vegetable you can highlight a nutrient that it has and make that connection for them and at the same time talk about how Processed foods have too much sugar, which hurts your liver and which, and you know, explain the biology of it to them because they are fascinated by that. Kids are always asking questions. I have a four-year-old and I think they say the average four-year-old asks 432 questions a day. So letting some of those questions, you know, guide them into nutritional answers. Um, and then the other side of that is if they're eating healthy foods consistently at home, even if they're somewhere else and they choose a less than healthy food, they're going to not feel good and they're going to make that connection themselves. And so I think while we don't want to become, you know, so totalitarian that they never try these other foods, we want to create a healthy environment at home so that when they do try these other foods in other places, they feel that reaction in their bodies and they learn it themselves because really that's going to teach them much more than us just telling them is that they feel it. Hmm. That's such a powerful statement. You know, it, it works for adults superbly well as, as well, right? I mean, oh, yeah. This whole idea of not being dogmatic and saying, okay, eat more kale, but when you actually feel what it's like in your body. You know, I think of kale, I think of vegetables as being medicine, mm -hmm. and the rest of it as being food. And I, I think that when you feel that in your body, nothing can replace that. Can't touch that. Didn't MC yeah, Hammer totally. say that? Yeah, he definitely <laughs> Can't touch this, but technically, oh, yeah. right. Okay, thank you. So, Katie, you know, you, I feel like you just tagged me because I had this experience this morning with my nine-year-old daughter where I was making the assumption, you know, you just made this point about challenge your own perceptions and your own assumptions about what your kid will eat. I was trying to figure out the meal plan for dinner, and I was asking my nine-year-old, I said, okay, let's pick the vegetable. Do you want steamed broccoli? And that's how I often frame it. And she actually said to me, no, mom, here's what I'm really excited about. I want some baby bib lettuce. And I also would like some sliced Persian cucumbers. And I like fell out of my chair when she said this because she's been eating steamed broccoli for so long. And I, I just think that's such an important point that we, you know, hit the reset button and don't just assume what our kids want to eat. Exactly. And I think the science says it only takes like 10 times of trying something for your palate to adjust. And so that's an attitude we also try to have with our children is if they don't like a certain food in the beginning, we just ask them to try it every time. We don't force them to eat a gigantic plate of kale if they don't love kale. But we <laughs> tell them like, well, that's great. You only have to try it nine more times and then you're going to like it. And also just framing things like, you know, when you're older, you're going to like it and associating healthy food with 
a, a more refined palate with growing up. So they want that. They want to develop that. Mm, good. Yeah, the science, I think, on tasting is that your taste buds turn over completely every two weeks. So trying mm -hmm. something 10 times makes a lot of sense to me in terms of the, the turnover of your, your taste receptors. So I got a question for you. Um, this is something that parents complain to me about all the time is like, you know, I try to be all good, but all of these idiot birthday parties, every time I take my kid to one of these par parties, it's all pizza, soda, and cake. And so I don't want my kid to be like the, the freakish one at the party. So how do I keep them from eating that junk when all of their peers are doing it um, in, in perpetuity? I would love to hear both of your guys' perspective on this, really, because you're both moms and I'm you know, just getting into this game. And I just I have zero tolerance for people's sloppy behavior kind of you know, drooling into my, my kid's life. But this is a real problem. And you know, it seems like if your kid's at school age, they're at a birthday party every week or so. It's true. That's definitely one of the toughest ones to navigate, I think. And we're, my oldest is almost eight, so we're just now getting into that season of birthday parties all the time. And it is hard. I think on the one hand, you can bring healthier solutions for them. You can bring like a homemade, like coconut flour cupcake that doesn't have refined sugar or something. But really the root of it is you want to teach them to make those choices themselves and not to want it in the first place. So that goes back to the education side and especially my older one now um, he knows from experience he's had a few birthday parties where he's like mom can I have this and I realized you know that's the teaching experience they have to try it so he's tried it and then you know for four hours after my tummy hurts and so he's learned that and now he usually will ask like is this healthy or is this gonna make my stomach hurt and a lot of times he won't choose that but I think it's that's a process and not something you can just turn on overnight. That's something we should strive for with our children, but not necessarily enforce with an iron fist. Because um, I know like growing up for me, there was a lot of celebrations where it was always candy and soda and just junk. And that, um, that created like an emotional connection for me, I think with unhealthy foods. And so like I associated certain foods like cake with times when you know, family time and happiness. And I think that's a really dangerous connection to make with children because then later in life, if they're upset, they can fall into that trap of turning to those foods to try to make them happy, like the inverse relationship of that. And so I think that's the more important thing to protect is not their occasional exposure to unhealthy foods, but the mindset they have connecting food and pleasure and really teach them that food is for nourishment first and try to make that an education point for them so that when they're in those situations that they learn to not choose them themselves. Yeah, I, I totally agree with all of those points, Katie. I really appreciate that. And I I also think um, I agree, you know, my kids, if I if I brought a coconut, you know, almond flour cupcake alternative to a birthday party, they would just roll their eyes. Like they're they're not gonna have that. They wanna have the toxic stuff. And they'll even articulate that. So I appreciate the point you made earlier, Katie, about how we want them to discover the truth in their own bodies. Like, I think there's some value to that, although honestly, it hasn't had as much impact as I would hope. <laughs> but the other point I want to make about this is I think it's helpful to have this conversation about high fructose corn syrup and what happens when you eat it. You know, what we know is that when you look at someone and the foods that they're eating, when they're eating vegetables, when they're crowding out all the crap with the healthy foods that are that have a high nutrient density, they're not gonna overeat the toxic stuff. But the toxic stuff has a different impact on metabolism. I just was looking at some of the data on fructose and how fructose doesn't seem to weigh in in terms of satiety the way that other foods do. So I like this idea of kind of swapping out and crowding out the bad stuff with more of the good stuff. So before they go to that birthday party, which tends to be in the afternoon, I found, you know, like one o'clock to three o'clock, four o'clock, you want to make sure that you've really packed them with a healthy, nutritious breakfast, you know, not something that's super high carb, but maybe they've got two pastured eggs that are scrambled and they've got some pastured pork that's been made into uh, bacon, you know, I really like to make sure that they've got a nourishing breakfast that day to try to crowd out the crap that they're about to eat. Yeah, and the other thing with parties is the ki the parents are usually more focused on the food than the kids are. If there's another activity, the kids just want to play. So I've before I've asked other moms, you know, are you going to eat at the beginning or at the end? And just I tell them like 
my kids are kind of intolerant to foods. They're not only one actually has an allergy, so I don't want to lie and say they're allergic, but I say they really are intolerant to certain foods. So it's sometimes easier for us if we just show up after they've eaten or like, you know, show up in the beginning and then have to leave before they get into like the cake and candy, which kind of stinks for the kids, but it also, or they'll just keep playing. Like if they're not hungry, if they've already eaten a huge breakfast or lunch, they don't want to stop jumping on the trampoline or playing baseball or whatever it is to go eat cake. So usually it's the parents like hurting all the kids like, hey, come eat cake. And if you can just kind of head that off, then it's sort of a non-issue. Love that. Yeah, you know, there's so much stress that parents have uh, just in terms of society and what they're learning and peer pressure and all this other kind of stuff uh, that food somehow gets swept under the rug sometimes. It's like, well, yeah, just feed them. They're hungry. And it's like almost, you know, in, in our perspective, obviously, like on the health side, it's like number one. Right, and, and so kind of reversing that and turning the table and, and making them understand food and have a better relationship with food seems to then kind of set them up for success in all the other metrics because then they're not cranky, they're not moody, they're not leveraged by the, the, you know, whatever the peer pressure is. And so I, I find that to be uh, an incredibly powerful stance a parent could take. Uh, it, what about exercise? I got, you know, sorry, I'm just kind of poking around here because there's so many things with parents that I have in my, my brain archive from stuff that parents have complained in the clinic for years about. What about these dumb video games and their, uh, their ability to pull an active child into a two-dimensional reality and kind of blunt their minds? Like, what, what do you guys do on that end? What have you been kind of going back and forth with your mommy bloggers on? Because I'd love to hear what a solution could be there. I'm going to put myself pretty firmly in the mean mom camp on this one. Um, we <laughs> don't allow video games in our house at all, period. Um, just because I think it does. It gives the mental perception that they're doing something and having an activity when they're really not. Um, and I've, I've seen in my own family, like extended family, people who have just really gotten sucked into the video games and have lost years of their lives just sitting there playing video games. Um, but even with TV, I think you mentioned earlier about commercials that are geared towards kids and I think those are huge and I've noticed even when my children have watched even like little bits of TV they notice these foods or we'll be driving and they'll be like there's Taco Bell and I'm like you've never been to Taco Bell in your entire life how do you know that that's Taco Bell and um, so we really limit that also with them we pretty much they don't watch TV unless it's a family movie or a sporting event that we're watching together um, and I'm always telling them like take off your shoes and go play outside barefoot in the sun and get your vitamin D and you know, t be in touch with the earth. And I think if you provide those opportunities for kids, they really do love to be outside and build forts. Like if you just give them some old sheets and boxes and sticks, they'll build forts all day long and make clubs that grownups can't come in. Or we built a treehouse this year that's got a climbing wall and ropes and monkey bars and things that facilitate healthy exercise and climbing. But they don't think of it as that. Like we have a zip line and they run back and forth on that thing hundreds of times. And they're getting tons of exercise and they just consider it playing. So I think kids have a built-in like fitness counter. They naturally do it. Like adults, we're all getting like Fitbits and step counters. They do it naturally if you just let them and if you don't give them distractions. So we just really limit the screen time in general and the video games completely. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to differ in my opinion on this. And I have older kids, so that may be part of the reason here. I limit my kids to an hour of screen time and they get to pick what that is. And I also want them first to do an hour of activity. So that shows up in a lot of different ways. You know, for my kids, they're crazy into Just Dance. In fact, Pedram, I think we forced you to do Just Dance. I think you did a really good um, Jennifer Lopez, if I remember correctly, when you came to visit. But in any case, you know, that's it's a way for them to do some of the video games and yet get some activity because I feel like, I would love to be a purist, but it's just not my personality. And I can even tell you, when I played video games as a kid, I know that it helped me with my laparoscopy skills when I first became a gynecologist. Now, I'm not doing laparoscopy anymore, but I, I think there are some benefits to it. And, and along those lines, I just was talking last weekend to a friend of ours, Dr. Srini Pillay, and he's talking about like how to make an Angry Birds that is good for the brain, like good for kids. The kids don't have to know it, but let's tell the parents that, okay, this is a video game that actually improves the neural networks of your, of your mind. So I, I'm holding out the hope that these things are going to get better with time and that they can be leveraged. But I'm a little bit 
I'm a little bit, uh, what would that be, left of you, Katie, <laughs> in well, terms of allowing it. Great, though, that you're encouraging the activity first. And yeah, I'm sure there are great options. I just am still able to be a purist with your ages, so I do. But I think that's awesome. And I know there's websites like, I think it's Luminosity for adults that are kind of based on the video game idea, but they train your IQ. So yeah, I think there's some fascinating potential there. Yeah, this has been an area of interest for me for a long time. Um, I got sucked into a video game at one point in college, and it was great until I realized, you know, 14 hours had gone by. Um, and, and, you know, just strategy games. But I, I will say that that strategy game has helped me in my business career, and it's helped me in understanding how to kind of move all the pieces in my life. But I probably have low back pain because of it. Um, and, and so... I got into neurofeedback and uh, some of the wonderful technologies that are out there now. Uh, you, you know, we were doing it with ADD kids, but I think that this is incredibly applicable if we can use brainwave entrainment uh, for kids with their video games. It's getting there. I mean, the what is it? The um, Xbox One we were just playing the other day, the river rafting thing. It was ridiculous how cool it was. But you know what? I'll still take river rafting any day of the week, <laughs> exactly. right? And and that's the thing is like, why are we approximating reality when we have have one all around us, right? And so hopefully, um, you know, we could bridge the technology uh, natural activity gap uh, in in the future. But I'm, I, I think I'm kind of more on the uh, on the purist side myself. And I'm, it's easy for me to be totalitarian because I'm a martial artist. I, I, I think that it's just. <laughs> Uh, it, it just I don't see the I don't see it outweighing the the risks at this point um, with all of the stagnation that they already encounter um, in in life and sitting in classrooms and stuff. But uh, it remains to be seen. I still my, mine's still just a peanut. <laughs> Maybe that's the connection. I, we do martial arts also. We're in jujitsu as a family, all of us. Um, but that's a good point. Maybe that's a solution too. I know all as adults, we're all getting into the standing desk and treadmill desk because we are reading the research on how bad it is to sit. So maybe. If we let kids watch TV or let them play video games, just don't let them sit down. Tell them you can play as long as you're standing up or walking on a treadmill. That's interesting because if they're standing, they're eventually going to get bored and walk away and then go do something, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> do something more corrupt. Uh, I like that. Okay, I'm going to institute that change. And Pedram, <laughs> you inspired me to get my standing desk. I'm standing at my standing desk today. It's super exciting. Yay. Yes, awesome. Yeah, I, I, I did, what, maybe a few months ago now. And I just, I love it. Like, I'm here, I'm bouncing around. I, I just love the standing desk. Um, <laughs> we had a funny moment the other day where I did a number, we were doing a summit, and I did like eight uh, interviews in a row and I turn to Lorenzo and I go man I'm so tired of standing here all day he's like yeah that's why we have chairs <laughs> <laughs> like right oh, but it's good. worth it I like I actually my core what my first week or so my core was getting sore from just standing because I realized I was kind of collapsing so much around the desk so it's a it's a powerful tool it is it powerful is. So I'm going to recap, and Katie, I want you to keep me honest here. I'm going to go through some of these main points that you've made today. So I really liked that first point that you began with, that you got into this because you were at your six-week appointment with your first baby, and you read that line about longevity, that for the first time in, was it two centuries, that today's kids won't live as long as our generation. So that was just a stunning, defining moment for you. Number two, I, I got to make this point about how a worried mom will do better research than the FBI. I think that is so important, and we want to leverage that whether you have kids or not. Number three, Pedram asked you about what wakes up the mama bear energy, and um, I really like this point. You talked about education and especially the marketing of unhealthy food, how that is such an important angle to galvanize mothers. You made this point number four about taking little baby steps, you know, how they add up to major transformation. You talked about your 30 day challenge, the swaps, the recipes, the meal plans. I think this is really important. And uh, Pedram, you had a great line there about countering thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Number five, big food, how to lubricate the elegant swaps. And Katie, you had such a great point here about challenging your own perception and assumptions. And I, agreed with you that, you know, I was just kind of assuming steamed broccoli was on the dinner table tonight and my daughter corrected me. Number six, this mindset shift. I really like this. You talked, Katie, about how you don't want to set your, your kids up to always think about 
the cake and the birthday parties as the core of celebration. Like you want them to focus on the activity and the, you know, like connecting with their friends and the community element. I really like that. And then number seven, we finished with the video games. We had a little point counterpoint, which I think is always helpful for folks. You guys, I think, are a bit more purist than I am. I allow the video game screen time an hour a day. Katie, anything you want to add to that? Just really to encourage moms or even those who aren't moms yet but may eventually be parents, um, just that we really can make the difference. Because I feel like that is what can be so discouraging sometimes is it feels not only like we're fighting an uphill battle but that we're not even moving up the hill. Um, because there's just so much out there. We've got like, what is it, 95% obesity projected in the next two decades. And it seems like, okay, so I'm feeding my kids healthy food, but is that even going to matter? And just to really encourage everybody that, it, yes, it does. And if enough of us can do that, that those little changes will make the difference. And that if we can raise that healthy mindset in the next generation, then they will take that and run with it much farther than we even could. Amen, sister. Listen, I am so happy that you're doing the work that you're doing. Um, you have the potential to mobilize millions and millions. You already have, but you know, even more. And I know you said, well, what, what's, your, what's your magic number? 40 million is kind of critical mass of moms. I think if we could do that, that would make the changes. Awesome. So moms, uh, wellnessmama.com. Check it out if you haven't heard of it already. They're doing great work over there. Katie, you're a, a bold warrior, a fierce mama bear, uh, and you got five cubs, man. That's that's serious. That's more that's more than a minivan. I don't even know how you guys get around. That's true. <laughs> so Katie, thank you so much for joining us today. And I know our listeners are gonna wanna engage with you. They're gonna wanna check out your free 30-day challenge, wellnessmama.com. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's been fun. Thanks for being here. All right, everybody, we will see you next time. This is Dr. Sarah signing out. Goodbye, Pedram. Bye. Bye, everybody.